I never intended to write two entire novels on my iPad, but here we are, two years later and two novels drafted almost exclusively on a device that I'd for years labeled a glorified, blown up iPhone. So let's dive into why I've made a complete 180, from believing an iPad is only good for watching movies or taking awkward vacation photos to thinking that it's an indispensable writing tool. Since this is a long video, I've broken up the content into eight chapters. Check the description below and skip ahead if you're only interested in a particular topic, like Apple's Magic Keyboard. Now, let's dive in. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPad during an Apple special event in 2010, he understood that in order to convince consumers that they needed to buy yet another screen in addition to their phones and laptops, the iPad would need to be far better at some key things. So what are these things? Browsing the web, doing email, inspecting photos, watching video, listening to music, playing games, and reading ebooks. Notice that with the exception of replying to emails, these tasks all fall into the category of content consumption. As if to emphasize the point, Jobs demoed the device while sitting in a comfy lounge chair, the type of seat perfect for slouching through a lazy Sunday morning while reading a newspaper. And the iPad was almost solely a consumption device at launch. Jobs calls the digital keyboard a dream to type on. It's a dream to type on. And while I won't argue that I've sometimes thought of the digital keyboard while laying in bed, it's mostly been during nightmares. As someone who spends the majority of his time creating, writing, building websites, drawing, etc., I couldn't imagine ever choosing to do any of these tasks on anything but a computer. A computer is flexible. I get to dictate how many applications I'm running at once. I can do things like plug in a keyboard and mouse, rearrange windows however I please, and even do crazy things like open more than one browser window at the same time. When I'm working in between Illustrator, Photoshop, and Atom, I can drag and drop items throughout a transparent file system. At launch, and for many years afterwards, the iPad had none of these obvious and basic capabilities. You couldn't even see the iPad's own file system until late 2017, over seven years after the iPad's introduction. Change came at a glacial rate, but as the years ticked by, the iPad transformed into a genuinely useful tool. Only, we had to endure many years of Apple's stubbornness in the meantime. Apple launched the iPad with what were essentially modified iPhone apps. You could see a tiny version of the Facebook app in the middle of the iPad's 9.7-inch display, for example, or you could comically enlarge the app to fit the entire display. This led to interface elements the size of a giant's thumb and other quirks that made reaching for your phone a more obvious choice unless you had very poor eyesight. And I don't say that sarcastically. The iPad found significant market share with older individuals and those with medical issues that prevented them from seeing the tiny icons on a phone's screen. To its credit, Apple released a modified SDK with the iPad to take advantage of the full screen. This allowed developers to create what were in reality only marginally more complex apps than were possible on the iPhone at least at launch. To see what I mean, just look at this list of some of the top apps during the iPad's first year. Netflix, Pandora, Kindle, Google Earth, Angry Birds HD. The only popular apps that focused on productivity were Apple's own Pages and Keynote, and I doubt few would reach for these comparatively hobbled experiences over their Mac. Fast forward two years to 2012, and the situation was mostly unchanged. Yet, a few developers were beginning to dip their toes into the experimental waters of viewing the iPad as a tool for creators. Most obviously, the tablet presented a tantalizing opportunity for artists, who were already utilizing Wacom's Cintiq line of computer monitors to draw, at least if they could afford them. A popular app called Paper brought impressive drawing tools to the iPad, but it was hobbled by a lack of stylus support. Whereas I can draw precise lines on a Cintiq tablet, I had to use capacitive styluses to draw on an iPad. These require bulbous tips that mimic the way your finger disrupts the screen's electrostatic field, and frankly, the experience of drawing with one of these is barely better than using a finger. Then came the year when everything changed, 2015. In 2015, Apple shifted their iPad strategy. Gone were the days of Steve Jobs lounging in a chair and browsing the web. Instead, to my delight, Apple was finally ready to push the iPad towards its potential as a machine capable of productive work. One need only look at the iPad's external keyboard to see what I mean. Before 2015, 
Apple's only official solution for non-touchscreen typing was the hilarious iPad keyboard dock. For all the billions of dollars in R&D funds Apple pours into its various divisions each year, I doubt the poor employee who was stuck with designing the iPad keyboard received any of it. This is the iPad keyboard dock, and if you're familiar with Macs at all, you'll instantly see that what we have here is a Mac keyboard with a 30-pin connector glued to the back. The iPad is a portable device with amazing battery life, yet this awkward contraption was destined to live on a desk. Obviously, Apple didn't think anyone should really use the iPad to do a lot of typing. I should mention here that I did actually own an iPad before 2015, a base model I received at a deep discount with another purchase. I'd pull it out of my closet every few months, poke around a bit, then wind up letting it run out of batteries when I couldn't find a place for it in my workflow. I even bought a portable external keyboard, a device ironically called Pluggable, ironic because it's a wireless device. This keyboard folds into a case that's used as a stand for your iPad or other device. The experience was alright, but not integrated enough to stop me from just throwing my MacBook in my bag whenever I left the apartment. And then I bought and quickly sold one of the early bridge devices. I didn't like it because it was heavy and surprisingly hard to get the iPad in and out of the dock, which is something I do very regularly because I use the iPad for drawing. But let's get back to 2015. I have a lot to say about Apple adding gratuitous pro monikers to the end of products that don't easily fit into many, or any, professional workflows. Still, when Apple released the iPad Pro, I took the optimistic view that Apple was finally serious about improving the iPad's usefulness. As further proof, Apple also released the Apple Pencil, an actual stylus with a goofy charging mechanism capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wacom's offerings. Oh, a stylus, right? We're gonna use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? And the smart keyboard. I'll talk more about this keyboard in a bit, but first let's consider what made me finally give the iPad a real go. Here's a hint. It wasn't the new iPad Pro hardware, nor was it the physical keyboard accessory. No, it was a simple piece of software for iOS. This might sound hyperbolic, but a single app convinced me to give the iOS ecosystem another shot. Scrivener. I'll probably create a separate video as a love letter to Scrivener, but suffice it to say that I've tested nearly every other writing app and program designed for long-form literature across Windows, iOS, Android, Mac, and the web. But I keep coming back to Scrivener, despite some notable frustrations. Scrivener for iOS had a maddeningly long development cycle, but when it launched on July 20th, 2016, I pulled my iPad from my closet and tested it out. The experience was fluid, replicating my desktop workflow on a mobile device. I liked Scrivener for iOS so much that I ditched my Android device for an iPhone, just so I could edit my previous day's writing during my commute to the office. And I wasn't disappointed. I've been using Scrivener across Mac, Windows, and iOS ever since, syncing my files via Dropbox. As I said, a discussion around Scrivener probably belongs in its own video, so let's return to the hardware. By 2018, I had started to do a lot of my drawing on my iPad, so it was an easy decision to sell my older model and upgrade to the 2018 iPad Pro for the higher refresh rate and improved stylus. On a whim, I purchased the overpriced Smart Keyboard Folio, which is Apple's minimalist keyboard that prioritizes weight over comfort or convenience. In other words, it offers kind of a crappy typing experience. The best word I can think of to describe the keys is mushy. When you tap a key, it mashes down a couple millimeters and then pops back up just a bit too slowly. It's kind of hard to describe, but the keys manage to simultaneously feel soft while also hurting your fingertips if you type on them for too long. You know, I think it's because the key travel is so shallow, they bottom out suddenly like you're drumming your fingers against a desk. Not the best typing experience. The entire keyboard deck is wrapped in plasticky, splash and dustproof fabric, which is probably a good thing considering the key switches use Apple's dreaded butterfly mechanism. When Apple abandoned the traditional scissor switch mechanism used in almost all consumer laptops for their butterfly mechanism in 2015, they set off a controversy that stretched far beyond the narrow circle of keyboard enthusiasts. Most consumers thought the new switch mechanism introduced a horrendous typing experience, and everyone could agree that the keys were unreasonably loud. Even gentle typists could generate annoying clacking, 
is if they were typing on a mechanical keyboard but without any of the benefits. Even worse, the smallest bit of dust that found its way under any key might cripple that key permanently. Oftentimes, this would result in Apple having to replace the entire keyboard, because individual keys could not be serviced in most cases. So, it's a good thing that the smart keyboard folio and its predecessor are covered in fabric. And there is more to complain about. For example, the folio can only hold the iPad in one of two positions, neither of which feel entirely natural to me. Also, the external material is faux leather or something like that, which is susceptible to wear and tear. It doesn't age gracefully like real leather, and cleaning it fastidiously as I do doesn't prevent your finger grease from eventually soaking into the material. This creates permanent and somewhat disgusting blotches on the top and bottom. Oh, and there are no function keys or backlights, so good luck typing in the dark. Maybe I just need to work on my touch typing. Really, though, this keyboard's only two benefits are its light weight and that it is better to type on than the virtual keyboard. That's it. Nevertheless, I wrote more than 100,000 words using this terrible keyboard. And here's why. I truly believe that the iPad is about as perfect a writing tool as you can buy right now. If you've watched the whole video up until this point, you'll remember how I used to believe that traditional computers were superior because of their flexibility. Well, it turns out that maximum flexibility sometimes leads to minimum productivity. Let me give you an example. When I'm writing on my Mac, I tend to maximize Scrivener into full screen mode, then activate the typewriter view. But this doesn't erase my knowledge that I'm using a Mac, where the temptations run wild. Instead of writing, I could swipe over and edit some photos in Lightroom and Photoshop, or I could finish up that website I was building, or click through the dozens of Chrome tabs I have open at any given time. My computer can do pretty much anything I want, so remaining locked to a single task on a device built for multitasking is challenging, for me at least. Now consider the iPad. If you try to use an iPad like a Mac or Windows machine, you'll go bald from the frustration. The simplest tasks become infuriating, like moving a file from one app to another or, until recently, transferring photos from a memory card into an app that is not the default Photos app. And forget working between more than two apps, it's not going to happen, at least not easily. But stick with me here. The friction caused by an operating system that was never designed to support complex workflows makes single track tasks much more enjoyable. When you open an iPad app, it takes up the entirety of your screen by default. You're living within that app. You could switch to another app, sure, but for me, the temptation is negligible compared to when I'm working on my Mac or Windows machine. A full screen of Scrivener feels almost like I'm using a typewriter. The connection from keyboard to screen is direct. Also, Steve Jobs was right that being able to reach out and touch your screen creates a far more intimate experience. Whenever I switch back to my non-Windows laptop, I catch myself reaching for the screen before redirecting my hand to the trackpad. During the time I devote to writing, I try to focus completely. These intense periods of concentration used to last perhaps 15 minutes before I grew distracted by other tasks. While writing on the iPad, I found that I could concentrate for 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, then an hour. These days, I have no problem focusing solely on my story for an entire hour, interrupted only by a timer I set to remind myself to take a break. Not only that, but I'm also writing far more quickly than I ever did before. Sure, my sentences are terrible and need to be edited later, but at least I get them out, which for me is the hardest step in the writing process. When I switch back to writing on my Mac, I immediately revert to my prior level of poor concentration. Now, you might say that this is more of a psychological problem on my part, and I might even agree with you. But if this is what works for me, I'm still pleased, and maybe it'll work for you, too. And so it was that I wrote an entire novel using the crappy, yet overpriced smart keyboard folio. But then things got even better. Aside from the terrible folio keyboard, the single most frustrating part of writing on the iPad was editing what I wrote. Why? Because highlighting text with a finger is clumsy. The cursor never seems to sit exactly where you aim, and dragging to highlight multiple lines of text is similarly imprecise. In a way, it's a good thing, as it discourages over-editing on your first draft. In another way, it's horrible because it demolishes the flow as you write. I had a glimmer of hope that Apple would bring true mouse and cursor support to the iPad when they added an accessibility mode that supported this feature in a limited fashion. Then they did it for real, announcing the Magic Keyboard and rolling out trackpad support in iOS 13.4 in March 2020. 
By this point, I was already using my iPad as my primary writing device, at least for my initial drafts. So when Apple put the Magic Keyboard on sale, I purchased it without hesitation. I'm usually the kind of guy who agonizes over every purchase, a process that typically ends in me not making the purchase at all. But not so with this keyboard. Despite its $350 price tag, which, get this, is actually more than the starting price of Apple's cheapest iPad that it sells today, I couldn't have been happier with the purchase. Really. It beats the folio keyboard in every possible way except for weight, and while that's not a high bar to surpass, it's actually a decent keyboard in its own right. It's not magic, though. Most of its benefits flow directly from its increased weight. First and most importantly, Apple abandoned its troubled butterfly switches for traditional scissor switches. The keys have a satisfying amount of travel for such a thin board, and even managed to pack in a backlight. The keys bottom out with enough padding to prevent your fingertips from getting sore, and the pressure is firm without being hard to press. In other words, the keys feel neither too loose nor too tight. If you've used a MacBook made within the past year or two, then you'll know how it feels because it's essentially the same board. You're not getting ThinkPad level quality here, but it's honestly quite close. And did I mention it has a built-in trackpad? This allows for fast and precise text selection, which in turn means I'm never interrupted while writing. Gone are the days of awkwardly tapping the screen to highlight a word, and then trying to drag the cursor to the exact spot I want. It's weird to celebrate a product for giving me a feature that's existed on computers for literal decades, but here we are. The Magic Keyboard isn't perfect, however. For one thing, there's no function keys, which would be really useful for quickly adjusting the volume and screen brightness. Not a big deal, though, for you can accomplish some of what function keys would allow via trackpad gestures, like revealing the home screen or switching among apps. Another problem is that the screen doesn't tilt back quite as far as you'd like, especially if you're sitting with the keyboard in your lap. This is an inevitable design constraint because if it tilted further, I imagine the entire iPad would tip over backwards from the imbalanced weight. Remember, all the computer's guts live behind the screen, not below the keyboard like in a traditional laptop. I think a lot of the weight at the bottom is actually added by Apple to provide additional stability. Finally, Apple opted to use similar soft touch material on the bottom, back, and beside the trackpad as the folio. Maybe my fingers are just really gross, but the same grease spots accumulated no matter how often I clean the darn thing. I've also managed to wear away the material entirely on the bottom left, but that's my fault. I wear a brace in a somewhat hopeless attempt to prevent my carpal tunnel issues from worsening, and it abraded the plastic. At this point, you're effectively turning the iPad into the form factor of a computer, so why bother at all? I've come a long way from scorning the iPad as a useless toy. Then again, the iPad has come a long way from being a useless toy. The iPad Pro's introduction in 2015 began the iPad's shift from movie watching screen to productivity workhorse, and iPad OS's launch in September 2019 solidified Apple's new vision for the iPad as a device capable of replacing a laptop, not just supplementing it. Over the past couple of years, my work has been divided into thirds. Tasks I'd rather perform on an iPad, tasks I'd rather perform on a computer, and tasks I have to perform on a computer because the iPad can't do them. Writing my initial drafts and drawing are both activities I far prefer on an iPad. Its simplicity and distraction-resistant design mean I'm truly more productive. However, I still prefer the power and versatility of a traditional computer when editing photos in Lightroom and Photoshop, and a number of other tasks. And then some things, while technically possible on the iPad, are just not practical. All my coding takes place on a Mac, for example, as does most of my editing, which involves an application called Pro Writing Aid and an e-ink tablet. So that's how I use my iPad to write. I know I covered a lot in this video, but there's so much more to dive into. I could share the apps and tools I use for writing or my editing process as a couple examples. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in more details about any particular topic, and I'll do my best to incorporate the info into future videos. Before I go, I'd like to mention that I'm giving away two of my books for free right now on my website, ajwriting.com. If you enter your email, you'll receive links to the two books within a few minutes. The third and final book in the trilogy is coming soon, so you'll want to catch up on the first two books now. If you enjoy fast-paced fantasy romps, think more kid learns he has powers than high fantasy with elves and orcs, you'll probably enjoy these books. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.